Hello everyone and welcome to another Star Citizen video. My name is Brian, if you happen to be new to the channel and to catch everybody up to speed, I've been stepping into the world and history of Star Citizen over these last couple of weeks and you guys have been so incredible and have continued to send me so many great videos to both consume and also react to. So that's what this video is gonna be about. We're gonna react to Morph's uh, latest video. Now I'm filming this like right and early in the morning uh, and because uh, my internet's been going out oddly this week, and so I've actually managed to be able to download this video <laughs> over my cell phone, uh, you know, connection. So that way, if for some reason the internet goes out while I'm filming this, uh, that's not going to be a hindrance and I can continue on. So uh, wish me luck. Uh, I'm hoping that they bring in fiber uh, to the area. We haven't had fiber before, and I'm really excited. And if that's what they're working on, because then that will make the pain of having the internet go down several times this week uh much much more enjoyable we ended up having to push one of the star citizen streams because of it no internet <laughs> like there you go anyway i've talked long enough as a part of this intro let's dive into the video itself i've already pre-liked it and if you guys enjoy these videos like sub and uh jump into the discord i'd love to hear from you uh, as well so here we go so it's now been a couple weeks since CitizenCon concluded, but finally CIG have put up all of the 4K panels on YouTube, which is my cue to finally come in and do a comprehensive 4K summary of the entire two-day event. Ooh, now, as you might have guessed, there's a lot of information, and they talked for Fire many, many hours, and so putting this together has been a bit of a challenge. So my strategy here was to be very short with each panel, but to cover pretty much everything. Man, that looks but despite great. despite my best efforts to keep it short, it still ended up being over 40 minutes long, so I've bookmarked each section for you so you can skip to the parts that you're most mm. interested in. So if you guys think I did a good job by the end and you think I deserve it, please don't forget to hit that like, subscribe, and the bell icon so you know the next time I post ah, a yes. video. All right, let's get to it. The bell icon, I always forget about that one. Day one kicked off with a very impressive presentation on CIG's improvements to their engine, which they now officially call Star Engine. Ah, the video so played impressive. in one continuous segment where it really showed off the capabilities of the engine to go from big to small and back to big scale again in a way that no other engine can really pull off today. And it all kind of came off as them maybe advertising the engine to gain some additional mm -hmm. I revenue, felt, I but felt that's that. just speculation. At least is distancing themselves now from the Legacy Cry engine on which the Star I've seen some people even correct me in uh, in the reaction video talking about how they don't have any plans to to license this, which like I I'm, they do whatever they want, right? Like that's and that's perfectly fine. I would think though it would be interesting to see though. Like, because I, I mentioned like Marvels, but also I think about Star Wars. Imagine instead of them licensing it out, that companies come to them to build something insane. You know, like it's it's there. It's an advertisement, regardless of whether they're going to license it or not. Right? That's, that's so cool. Our engine owes its legacy too. The improvements to their engine included better lighting for clouds, which now cast more realistic shadows on the environment as well as themselves. The fact is that scenes with clouds look far more realistic than they did before. Mm -hmm. Ground fog was also introduced, which further helped to increase a sense of distance in ground scenes on planet surfaces. They also showed off further improvements to fire propagation and how it's generated from components and damage. Man, the demonstration showed wow. off a functioning in-game fire extinguisher, which effectively put out the fire in a limited area. Huge improvements to water was also demonstrated with better screen space reflections, textures, <laughs> integration with the environment, and actual water-based physics. The effect of this new tech was most impressive when they showed the Gladius skimming the water mm. surface where it created a wake behind it. Now, if only they can improve rivers, which now feel a little bit dated. We also mm. got to see a huge improvement to their tear and blood tech for characters, which will make a huge difference for scenes where close-ups are required for Squadron 42 and eventually Star Citizen. Next, they showed off the new scope shader, bringing visuals up to modern standards. Unfortunately, mm, it doesn't look like they're using picture-in-picture -picture tech like Tarkov does for zooming. We also got to see their work on integrating HDR tech into Star Citizen in a more comprehensive way, which Ian Leyland mm. told me he's very proud of, and I look forward to seeing more of in Star Citizen. 
This led to a suitable segue into performance improvements. Oh, this cool. This will come in the form of three different temporal upscaling modes, TSR and the FSR2, and as you guessed it, DLSS2. No word, though, on DLSS3. Yeah, I'm TID glad he said that. putting effort, though, into their own TSR, which shows some impressive results if the numbers are to be believed, showing performance gains as much as twice as what they were in native resolution. All right. The panel then shifted to Planet Tech improvements, where they talked about how they're looking to use AI to generate terrain. This should help address issues like tiling with their current system. We just uh, had uh, uh, David Jaffe, who is the creator of God of War, on uh, the podcast this week. Just had kind of an impromptu game of the year uh, discussion and ended up going into like AI, geopolitics, because that's who we are, and uh, as humans, uh, and so much more. But the AI dev conversation was fascinating that it's that uh, it's going to, there's going to be like so much interesting pieces of this. Uh, both for the big companies, but also for a lot of us smaller devs out there. And so anyway, if you guys check it out, I hope you enjoy it regardless. But um, I'm just AI in in development, like especially when I start thinking about Star Citizen, you start thinking about like having a player do something that maybe was unexpected, but then the system handles it anyway. They also look to shift the object scattering 100% to the GPU, which will address the bad pop-ins that we experience mm. presently, as well as performance issues related to the generation of planet surfaces. After sharing that they're close to Vulkan integration so as to take advantage of the performance benefits as well as additional oh. features of the API, they also wow. dropped a bit of a surprise here with the promise of ray-traced global illumination. This promises to have a large impact on the quality of lighting in all spaces and will make things like players and objects Man, feel a lot more a part so of the That's so cool. Yes. In. They also demoed this in a software mode, which will promise to deliver similar visual quality for those with lower end systems. But as a bonus, this mm. will also help designers provide consistent lighting between all system specifications. Next, they discussed a substantial improvement to their clothing physics engine, which they call Starcloth. The way they demonstrated it though was pretty interesting and highly memeable, and we all had a good laugh at the show when this happened. That's so all funny. All the scenes though now feel way more visually realistic in ways that I didn't expect, especially where the environment affects yes. the character's clothes, such as where there's wind. a lot of wind. That's amazing. AirTech though has also seen great improvement where they look to have changed the way that strand physics are calculated, resulting in far more impressive and realistic hair simulation. Keeping with the physics theme, Maelstrom, CIG's name for environment destruction tech, was then demonstrated. This feature looks to tie into future gameplay, as well as Squadron 42's first-person experience, where obstacles can now be destroyed during Dude. fight scenes to remove cover from enemies as well as yourself. They also showed how they applied this tech to ship destruction to make far more realistic explosions. <laughs> as well as far-reaching implications for vehicle combat going forward where pieces of a ship can be blown off. Next, they showed off how they've improved the audio for ship and FPS weapons to give them a lot more oomph than they've had before. Hmm, okay, that sounds great. Oh. Oh, wow, okay. I thought it sounded they great, and then they were like, oh, no, we made it better. Mode, which will please a lot of space nerds, I'm sure, especially fans of Battlestar Galactica. Man. Finally, in a bombshell announcement, Paul Rindell came on stage and demoed a working version of server meshing. I already covered this in a dedicated video as it's one of the most important things they discussed in the entire event. So I'll just get to the point here. It worked in real time on stage, hosted on laptops backstage. This means that CIG looks to be able to deliver the promise of Star Citizen that they've envisioned. Cool. It still needs a lot of time to cook though in the oven and the replication layer, the tech that comes beforehand, has yet to come online in the upcoming 321.x patch. I think it's that one, but I'm not sure. I still think they're shooting for Q1 next year, but that's just speculation. Mm, okay. This, by the way, as a reminder, is the tech they need to actually fully release Pyro. So we're going to have to wait a little bit for Pyro, which release to the live servers. Then came the presentation on engineering in the panel called Fix It and Fly It, headed by the EUPU team. 
As a disclaimer though, the visuals that they showed in this showcase weren't final art. That's what they wanted to let us know, so don't become too attached to the way it looks. <laughs> they explain here how the resource networking tech that they've been working on will be the underlying tech that powers the entire game system, from ships to outposts to stations and more. Players will interact with it through engineering gameplay loops as well as puzzles. They broke down the interactions players will have with this mechanic into cool. tuning used for preparing ships for situations, and then went on to discuss maintenance and damage control, which is what you'll need to do to keep your ship going in combat or for regular wear and tear upkeep. They then showed in a physical demonstration how components can be replaced or repaired using a new repair beam. It's a bit of a meme at this point, beam citizen, <laughs> but I guess how else would you do it? Maybe, I don't know and then moved on to the explanation for power distribution mechanics, similar to what we have in other space games you might be familiar with. Engineers will need to choose what systems get what power in a limited pool of power points available, which can be supplemented temporarily via batteries, which will deplete and need to be recharged over a longer period of time. Sadly, this looks to be mostly concept right now because there was no in-game demo shown for this. Next though, they did actually demo some working in-game mechanics where they showed off an interactive in-world ship screen on the bridge of an A2, which is a medium-sized multi-crew ship. In the demo, they showed off a fight between a Gladius and a manned A2, where we got to see how nodes in the network can be damaged and have to be replaced. They also demonstrated how the engineering panel can be used to identify which components need to be repaired in real time. Hmm. It also showed how engineers can control the operation of doors, components, and even atmosphere in different compartments. This then tied into damage control, where a fire extinguisher wasn't enough to put out a fire. An engineer then chose to vent the compartment to reduce the fire down to nothing. Fires can spread through misfires of components and create signature bursts which make you more detectable to other players and NPCs, so dealing with them quickly seems to be important. I also imagine if the fire spread too much, the ship would probably explode. Seeing this come together though was really exciting and shows how big ships will nearly be impossible to handle in combat alone going forward. It oh, reminded yeah. me a bit of a more intense version of Sea of Thieves, and I look forward yes. to trying this out with friends. And on that note, they revealed that they would be releasing a test version of this on Arena Commander so we can see how it works hmm. in a small set of ships. However, it doesn't seem to be that close, so we may have to wait <laughs> quite a few patches before we get this for all ships in game. That's one of the things when it comes down to uh, software development where my inner developers like you're going to be transparent i there's some gamers out there who cannot handle like that level of transparency because uh everything that's ever shown off uh is like they take it as a committed full throttle promise however what we're seeing though here is that uh they are showing things off they're working in that same direction the thing i see that has i've from the uh the star citizen players uh from the citizens who are frustrated is that like for example you brought up the server meshing that's taken so much time uh, i think they were trying to say at least from my limited understanding from what i've uh, heard and seen already uh this was like supposedly supposed to be back in 2020 and here we are in 2023 and uh, the thing is is that yeah, delays happen, you know, and I guess it may be the thing that frustrates other <laughs> gamers against me is that like as a father of six, y'all, like there's a level of things I'm like, I'm willing to wait for it to be good. Uh, and the difference what I see here where I compare this game, uh, not in a like uh, not trying to couple these things together, but where you look at Anthem where they were like, yeah, we're going to be transparent. We're going to show you guys what's going on. Oh, by the way, it's canceled. Um, I think you can see here that why I think what they're doing here with uh, with Star Citizen is so special because they could have just said, yeah, we couldn't figure it out, right? No, they're like, well, it took us more time than we wanted. Let's keep moving forward. Then came the ship panel presented by John Crew, vehicle director and Ben Curtis, vehicle art director. By the way, guys, I think on today's stream, hopefully y'all can help me pick what first ship I should purchase. So. I need your help. I'm excited. Um, I don't have a lot of, I don't have a budget, but I think it may be around a hundred bucks. Uh, let's see if that ends up being something possible. Well, well, anyway, tune in. They began with their recent completed work on the Crusader A1, a visually stunning ship that I look forward to reviewing in an independent video. 
and then moved on to discuss their current and ongoing work. And of course, no Citizen Con would be complete without the reveal of a few concept ships. The first one on the docket was the RSI Zeus Mark II, based off a historical ship that first tested quantum travel in the lore of Star Citizen. The updated version will offer three variants, the ES, the Essential, an Explorer, the MR or Mark, a Bounty Hunter variant, and finally the CL or Clipper for hauling. They each have slightly different interiors to better suit their use. Particularly of note is the MR with a quantum dampener and an additional turret as well as an armory and a place to store two bounty pots. It was an impressive look at how far CAG have come making well-crafted interiors that better utilize the space while simultaneously better plan their configuration of spaces. I do wonder though how this fits next to the constellation. Sadly though, the Zeus is still in white box and we're gonna have to wait some time to see it in game. The word still, later this is, is so something cool. like in the next 12 months, but an exact ETA was not given. Next though was a presentation on a new variant of the Drake Cutter, a scanning ship, and sadly, there's no functionality to it. Mm -hmm. They did though offer an explanation for how it will work. Just like FPS scanning, there's going to be a quick scan for line of sight short range scanning, but the charge scan will be much longer range than what we have right now, capable of detecting ships as far as those in quantum travel and will automatically give jump points to the locations of those ships in quantum. This eventually will be a logistical must for fleets of players, but sadly there was no word on when these mechanics will come into the game. I was under the impression that they were done introducing ships without functionality based on something John Cruz said a while back, but I guess that's changed and was probably unavoidable since they're focusing now on Squadron 42. They then went on to address the enormous backlog of ships. You may recall that I did a video some time ago about this subject where I figured out that they have around 10 years of work if they do it efficiently, ignoring going gold standard on some of the older ships. They provided context for the slowdown though, being that some senior ship artists had left CIG, leaving okay. ships like the Van Merchman in an unfinished state. Those guys were guys, by the way, who went to SA. <laughs> Anyway, the point of this is to let you guys know that they're aware of the workload and they're working to address it. One of the ways they're working to address it is by hiring more people. They're now up to 24 members, including some new members from the Turbulent Studio. John Crew then segued into ships featured in Squadron 42, where he began by announcing that the Idris, a capital ship featured prominently in the single player campaign, would release alongside Squadron 42, as well as with its variants. The Javelin though he noted would need to wait a little bit longer, so big sad on that one. The updated <laughs> Van Duel ships though will be released as well with Squadron, so yay there. They then proceeded to tease us with their upcoming work via a silhouette reveal, including <laughs> the RSI Polaris. That's an Idris-sized RSI capital ship, by the way. They then explained that one of their strategies for attacking the backlog is to work on the same manufacturer, in this case, RSI, to get a bunch of the ships down in close succession. So that way they can move across similar assets and work more efficiently on the builds. From my own experience, this is a pretty smart move and I look forward to seeing their results. They look then to get all the big RSI ships done in the next 12 months alongside all the other ships discussed in the panel. This is where some people believe John may have inadvertently revealed that Squadron 42's internal timeline is also 12 months. This mm, overall okay. then wasn't the most impressive ship panel for ship releases, but it was packed with a lot of good information and I'm grateful they shared it. The next panel of the day was Navigating the Universe, where what was discussed was exactly as advertised, how players navigate the universe. This is the panel they discussed the new map in, by the way, so I'll get to that in a moment. First, they demoed the new FPS HUD from Squadron 42, which will be translated eventually into Star Citizen in the coming months. The new HUD presented a clean and unobtrusive look with notable improvements to the AR markers for objectives and waypoints. The HUD also included refinements to FPS scanning mechanics, with the top of the screen now tying into EM, IR, and audio spectrums. Very cool. These tie into the detectability of a player in stealth gameplay. Where exceeding the white area makes you detectable, which can be triggered by being loud or scanning, which they discuss next. There are now two FPS scanning modes, charged and quick scan. Quick scan is a passive mode that presents information for things within line of sight, whereas the charged version shows through walls but spikes your emissions making you more detectable, potentially alerting players and NPCs to your location. This led into showing the new Mobiglass UI where 
A huge step forward was presented that looks with the so much better. Departing from the ancient flash tech that the original Moby Glass was based on. Next, though, was the highlight wow, of this Wow, I panel, like that. The map system, which began with demonstrating how the map mechanics will work as downloadable data, creating the bones of what is probably going to be data running and trading information. Once the player downloads the map into their Moby Glass, the map becomes available in both the app as well as on the player's HUD. CIG highlighted that this runs in real time, giving the tech impressive implications. Things like the status of doors, locations of players, and waypoints can be seen in real time. I gotta say it was also pretty impressive to see them pull off the hollow special effects look, because I was a little worried it wouldn't be very visually legible, but I think it actually works really well. They then showed off how it can be used as a personal GPS device to navigate to waypoints and how you oh, can generate your all right. own waypoints. This has far-reaching implications for group gameplay, for communicating yes. the location of points of interest, for enemy locations, and for trading information on the location of valuable things. They then stepped directly onto a Carrick showing the seamless transition between the two maps because <laughs> the system is after all unified. This is when though they proceeded to blow everybody's mind where they revealed that the system is actually unified all the way up to the system level map. Here we got to see an improved and much more legible labeling system as well as much clearer <laughs> oh, planets. Those labels are so much better. Representing the system as a whole. That's actually one of the uh, the key uh, frustrations that I've had because I've seen people are like, oh, you ignored this message pop up. And it said, for some reason, the labeling and the fonts. And I have like great vision, like 2015, 2020 vision. Uh, and... I was still struggling with reading some of the text and the fonts, et cetera, but looking at uh, what they've been showing off already, like it is so much more, I think, clear as to what's happening, especially with uh, how they've kind of segmented uh, the different, <laughs> the, the different like main menu. Uh, I forgot what they ended up calling it. I'm, I'm learning still, but uh, yeah, where you bring up uh, your kind of menu to be able to bring up your star map and so much more. Uh, this, that looks such like such an improvement visually, for me, I don't know how you guys feel about that. You can let me know one way or the other, uh, but I think this is, is continuing to be st uh, stepped in the right direction. Like just looking at the screen right now, like it's like I can I can read everything that they were being uh, shown. I, the icons are, are much more clear and prominent. And so it, it feels less uh, stressful where at the same time, uh, you know, it, it feels more inviting, I guess, to a kind of a, a, a broader base, but still without dumbing down the game. It, you know, I was like, I, I think I was saying like, yeah, if they could change some of the fonts around and 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 more, this becomes so much more discoverable for those uh, those of us who are driven to kind of just figure things out on our own without having to watch a guide or something like that. Well, as scaled until you zoom in where starts to become more full scale. I really like the way that they made this. It seems like Man. they must have taken a lot of time to figure out what would work best. That or looks great. Easily allowing people to read what a system looks like. One potential issue though was accidentally revealed towards the end of this presentation where they showed off the terrain a little bit. I felt here that this is where the hollow look kind of fell apart a bit. Okay. It started to become a bit unclear and personally I'd prefer they switch to a textured look at this scale. That way we can more easily differentiate between vegetation and water obstacles that could be more useful for tactical situations. Overall though, it's still a huge step in the right direction and I look forward to having this. Honestly, if we had it today, it would be leagues and leagues ahead of what's in the current version of Star Citizen, which let's be honest, is pretty much unusable. This then concluded <laughs> the day one presentation set, getting them off to a really good hey, start with DC, some welcome. stuff. Server meshing probably being my Thanks personal that subscribe highlight button. for the day, but let me know what you thought was the highlight here. There was a lot left to discuss though on day two, so let's dive straight into that. Day two then kicked off with a panel titled Character Development headed off by Ian Leyland, Star Citizen's art director. The first segment mm. focused around pyro content, showcasing clothing and armor befitting the tone of pyro itself. Key features being cobbled together clothing and generally feeling worn down in mm. stark contrast to the clean look of Stanton. This led to them then talking about a new pouch system to augment our inventories, a useful feature in an environment with few stops to resupply. I personally think this looks so awesome wild. and That's I can't amazing. wait till we have this. 
presentation then shifted to the gangs of Pyro, where they Ooh. showed off the Rough and Ready gang's visual identity, which centers on their tattoos, which is a completely new character feature for Star Citizen. These tattoos represent the rank of the gang, and it was revealed that players can work to earn them through the <laughs> reputation system with the gang. They then showed off the Headhunters gang next, who have a more post-apocalyptic Mad Max style. It mm -hmm. looked really cool, actually, and I actually want to get a set of this armor when it comes into the game. Finally, they talked about the Dusters gang, who are probably best known for being in the Stanton system. Here we got a look at their own set progression by gang rank, which was very cool looking. Again, it was noted though that these can be earned by players by repping up with the Dusters gang. This led then into wow. an exciting presentation on what armor is going to look like going forward in Star Citizen. Armor, it was explained, will be specialized for the task at hand, with greater differences for each type in protection, mobility, and utility. There will also be best-in-class armor types, with hindrances to armor that's used out of role, such Ooh. as, for example, wearing heavy armor and a snub fighter, which would be better suited for a flight suit, which would give the occupant better ability to handle G-forces. Mm. It was also explained that armor would go into some basic categories, combat, specialist, utility, and support, which will define the types of items available for the suit slots, which is the first time we've heard of restricting suits to certain types of equipment. This then led into hygiene, which is something <laughs> that we've heard about for years now, but really didn't know much about. Turns out that hygiene is going to be really important. You're going to have to take showers and keep your equipment clean. Poor hygiene will show us dirt and sweat on your character and will accumulate negative effects such as lowered health, disease, and snarky comments from NPCs. Oh my gosh, I remember when, if you guys have ever played Final Fantasy XIV 1.0, they had, uh, you had underwear that you had to change and to show you how bad the state of that game was at the time. It's like, I don't think you could get another pair or you had, uh, like you couldn't unequip them. Uh, so you ended up at, like, if you didn't have a backup pair or something like that, like it was, it was absolutely absurd, but it, it had, uh, like, you know, disadvantages and it was something that I think is really cool. What I like about the sandbox because, uh, 14 1.0 was a sandbox. Uh, 2.0 forward, they shifted to theme park where I really enjoy the sandbox, the realism, the downtime, all of these things, uh, you know, help actually produce creativity uh, in, in players. We've I think we live in a world that's hyper overstimulated, uh, you know, where you don't you don't have to ever be bored. And I think that I think in the long run isn't necessarily good. That's where I, I get a lot of value. I get a lot of hope in in sandbox because having that kind of downtime. Um, ends up kind of helping the social aspects of the game or like any other, like these other systems of the game help make uh, balance themselves out, make more sense when there is downtime. But if you're constantly always entertained, like especially in an action game, a lot of people are like, oh, I want an action game, but I also want all these other things. It's like some of that is directly, um, you know, <laughs> antithetical to what your, what your goal is. You can't have, you know, like if you want an action game where you got, 30 or you know 40 abilities like you would in kind of a tab targeting game uh like you're not gonna like take advantage fully of each one of those uh those skills but I'll take a sip of my coffee because my my voice is i can hear it <laughs> i can hear the early morning wearing dirty clothes will also negatively affect this attribute as well star cloth was then again revisited mm -hmm. where some cool clothes for pyro were shown off the That's cloak wild. looked especially yeah. amazing here then came a big reveal. They expanded on their explanation for their hair tech, leading to a new character customizer. This has been a bit of a sore spot for a while, and it's good to see them having improved it quite a lot, as it looks like they've kind of ditched the old system in favor of a more tactile system where you can sculpt facial features the way cool. you want. They also showed off new and improved options for more accurate skin tones and complexions, as well as a much better UI for selecting them. Facial hair was also shown off, something that's been begged for that's for a awesome. long time. Finally, we can have yes. beards. And finally, the hair selection was shown off, where an incredible amount of control was demonstrated over the hair color and pigments, down to how high or low the, uh, the dye is and how much dye is in the hair. It looked really, really cool. I actually have never seen such a detailed system in gaming before, so I think now we can easily say it's one of the best in the industry, if not the best. 
Following the impressive look at the character customizer, the next panel came up called Life in First Person, where the improvements to the new EVA mechanics were shown off once again. Here we saw improved transitions between gravity, which are a lot smoother than they are in hey, the game. Yes. So sadly, no more hilarious face planting. Oh my gosh, guys, if y'all hadn't seen that <laughs> that time I was going through different levels of gravity, like it was either not working or working. The elevators had like gravity sometimes. Uh, that was just so much, uh, so entertaining, especially as you transition from one spot to another, everything got thrown around. Uh, it was a challenge, but it was funny as all get out. Big sad. They also demonstrated how the new EVA tech can enable translation through previously difficult spaces and how grappling would allow players to take hold of handholds and surfaces to restrict their movement in zero G settings. Oh, the whole wow. Effect makes for a far more immersive experience and reminds me a lot of the expanse. They then went on to show the new prone movement, which looked a lot better in third person and first person and solves a lot of strange issues in first person that are present in our current version where players wow. wouldn't be able to move That's or impressive. would clip through geometry in weird ways. Improvements to ladder animations and use of ladders were also demonstrated, <laughs> taking the game up to a more contemporary standard. They also showed off the new sliding mechanic alongside improved snappier animations for general FPS combat that bring the game up to parity with some modern FPS titles. Nice. Importantly though, they did note that the sliding mechanic still needs to be balanced and there would be stamina involved in sliding, so hopefully we don't get a slidey McSlide face meta like in Modern Warfare. Mm -hmm. They then finished off the section with a peek at radiation effects on players, which can be mitigated by armor protection for a limited time or by using obstacles that directly obstruct the line of sight to the irradiated item. I imagine this is going to tie into pyro, especially for those solar flares that we've been seeing. As you oh, might expect wow. though, radiation accumulates and doesn't dissipate immediately. Unfortunately though, this panel didn't finish with any word on when we could expect to see these improvements. Then Inez Caldas came to the stage, sorry if I mispronounced your name, Gameplay Programmer 3 at CIG, came to discuss improvements to player interactions for what I'm told is her very first public presentation since starting to work at CIG, so a little round of applause for her, she did a great job. So the first thing she did was talk about the new radial menu for interacting with items that will give oh, players yes. much more intuitive control over how they interact with objects within the world. It came off as a lot more functional and visually superior than our current system. Yes, Improvements way better. Limited to just items. It also looks like CIG touched the elevator. animations for interacting with virtually everything a player can interact yeah. with in the world. Players now can physically interact with buttons, touch panels, levers, yeah. valves, which all come together to enhance the immersion of a player's experience, giving them a heightened sense of connection with the world. It also just looks damned cool. Yes. Then came another personal favorite of mine, a new looting UI. The system looks Ooh. much more intuitive and informative than what we have right now, especially where things can be equipped on your character's inventory versus the looted inventory. So you can see where those things connect and what you can swap over. Then came a series of new takedown animations where the idea of soft skills were once again addressed. Here they showed off how increasing your skill with takedowns will increase your chance to take down a player or NPC, either in a lethal or non-lethal takedown. It also showed that there's going to be a short mini event, a sort of skill check for the takedown, especially <laughs> if you are lowered skilled in that takedown. The animations looked visceral and even brutal in some of the moves, and I really like the way they're looking. Then during the non-lethal takedown segment, they showed off a new restraint mechanic, which CIG explained would be needed to help stop NPCs from alerting others once they became conscious again. But I imagine that this is also for bounty hunting V2 when they bring them over to Star Citizen. Then came a short demonstration where once again we saw their work on FPS scanning mechanics, which, which will help players get a better idea of the area and make more tactically sound decisions. The presentation then segued into the weapon wear and tear mechanics coming up. Similar to the ship version, weapons will accumulate dirt and wear depending on their use and location. As they increase in their wear and tear, negative effects will arise, such as weapon jams. 
It showed off a pretty cool clearing animation as well for when a weapon jams, which will make a player who encounters a jam much more vulnerable. This will encourage players to be a little bit more conscious of maintaining their weapon before going into combat. <laughs> Improvements to weapon recoil were also shown here, bringing them more in line with modern shooters. The new Volt Gun was also a big highlight for me because it looked really cool, especially how the firing sequence goes from bolts all the way up to a solid beam. It reminded me a bit of that gluon gun from Half-Life 2. Further That's FPS cool. improvements really were nice. then discussed with snappier ABS animations that's aimed down sights, and time to kill will also be increased according to CIG, but it wasn't really discussed how it would be increased, so hopefully we won't get any bullet sponges, which I personally hate. Weapon iron sights were also remodeled on pretty much every weapon to give a better target picture. They also revisited the new scope shader, which again, looked great. Closing out the FPS experience changes, they then demoed a new reloading from backpack mechanic, which will be an alternative to reloading from your rig at a much slower rate. Okay, then I don't, I don't. To discussing NPC. So that's something that hopefully uh, I can learn more about, uh, namely because I, I haven't actually done any of the uh, the gunplay yet uh, in the, in this uh, game. Maybe we'll get that uh, on the list for today because. Yeah, I'd love I'd love to see a little bit more about what that what that means and how to make sure I've got ammo and oh man, this game is so freaking cool. AI. Here, further developments on their complex NPC trait system was demonstrated. By mixing traits, AI will behave in different ways depending on the setting. For example, less experienced shooters may behave more rashly in charge with poor accuracy. The fear trait was also of particular interest, which would inform them whether or not they should avoid going through things like fire hazards. AI medics were also shown off here where they'll now be able to revive incapacitated teammates. Hopefully this will also work for players eventually as well too. Nice. AI resupply mechanics were also shown off, showing that AI would need to rearm themselves eventually. Yogi Klant, principal vehicle programmer, then took stage for the next panel on flight combat developments for the past two years while working on Squadron 42. This work will eventually though make its way to Star Citizen. Eventually. Inez once again took stage where she presented her team's work on the immersive cockpit experience that they've been working <laughs> on where they'll now have animations for interactables. She explained that they're code driven helping streamline the process. Tony Arias, senior UI programmer, then came on to talk about the UI changes for the ship's dash and HUD. The goal here, he explained, was to declutter and simplify the experience. He then talked about improvements to the multi-function displays, or MFDs for short, which demonstrated additional functionality and visual improvements. Things like target weapon posture and orientation are now shown in these systems. They also showed off how MFDs can cast to your helmet and how you can customize exactly what you want to see. Tony though added that this will require the appropriate helmet, hinting at the need for flight helmets as part of that whole armor presentation we had seen earlier. Yogi then retook center stage to talk about the addition of pilot force reactions, which are meant to help better communicate the acceleration and speed of a ship to pilots. But then Yogi shifted over to discussing their work on master modes, which we last saw at CitizenCon a year ago. As a recap, there are going to be two new modes. SCM mode for ship combat and ship activities where your ship's speed is restricted but you have full access to your weapons and shields, and navigation mode which is used for traveling and going into quantum where you won't have any shields and will not be able to use your weapons. Mm, A diagram was also shown here to demonstrate how thruster outputs are going to be recalibrated to favor rear thrusters, making for much more interesting combat and maneuvering. He then also confirmed that there's going to be a brief moment of transition between these modes which he explained means that if you transition from SCM to navigation mode to try to get away from a fight, that you'll be vulnerable for a short period of time where your quantum drive will be disabled if the player who's attacking you or NPC who is attacking you is using distortion weapons. Mm, interesting. The presentation then shifted to the quantum experience where he explained that the current system isn't actually fully physicalized, where ships are instead teleported at intervals along a spline between point A and point B. This new system is fully physicalized, which offers a lot of interesting gameplay mechanic opportunities, such as the new skill check mini game that they're going to have when you start going into quantum, which will require you carefully align your ship until it locks in, or you'll be thrown out of quantum travel. This will tie into quantum drive health, type, and grade. Hmm. 
Yogi commented you're going to really want to care about what type of quantum drive you buy in the future. Impressive new quantum effects were also simultaneously shown off here, which I must say look and sound so good. Yogi then demoed the QT boosting mechanic for short range jumps. This form requires a constant steady hand instead of being able to lock in for you to get to the other end successfully. Quantum boosting though will also work in any direction, which is going to make for much more interesting exploration and possible combat opportunities. They then went into explaining the ship AI improvements, where they will now follow a series of different behavioral types. Their actions are also programmed using data analysis of player encounters to make them a lot more challenging and engaging. It was noted though that they also programmed in mistakes to the AI as they found that perfect AI could be <laughs> a little too overwhelming and uninteresting at times. This demo then showed off the new UI improvements as well for targets, though this wasn't directly discussed at any point in the presentation sadly. Yogi then went into how weapons will also be getting a big rebalance, giving them each unique pros and cons. Weapon ranges will also now be effectively uncapped, but weapon hmm, spread will be the thing that encourages closer combat. Okay. The UI will inform players of this through a color system, green being maximum hit opportunity. Pip calculations were also then said to have been improved through a different calculation technique, which will make hitting targets a lot more consistent. Then precision targeting mode was introduced, which will allow players to zoom in on a target and paint segments for their gimbals to hit. It's a very cool looking mechanic and I look forward to trying it myself. To close out the panel for the day, Yogi then presented their work on control surfaces for atmospheric flight. To prove wow. that this was accurately being simulated, Yogi showed shutting off the thrusters in a live demo and how a ship could still be controlled. This is important as ships are not meant to use their thrusters used in space well in atmosphere as they're meant to overheat well there eventually. So you're not supposed to be able to hover indefinitely like over a target and just aim directly down and shoot it. This has been actually an issue in Star Citizen for some time. So this is looking to start relieving this balance problem. Then living on the edge. Break, they came back to do the living, living on the on edge the panel, edge. which was focused around the design process of the environments of Star Citizen. Here we learned about what drives environments, being informed by things like narrative to help make the visuals and gameplay make a lot more sense. In the context of the upcoming content in Pyro, they explained how things like reputation rewards help drove making tiers within stations for players to unlock. Eddie Hilditch then led a presentation showing how far they've come developing their library on outposts. The results Ooh. are much more impressive than what we'd seen in the past, and based what I saw in the Pyro demo, as well as the Pyro test servers that they currently have up, it really looks like they've accomplished making a living and breathing set of locations, but I'll be doing a more focused review on these later. Next though came the derelict outpost settlements, which are a little bit different in style and tone. These look a bit more like shanty towns and resemble what we now see in Stanton. The most impressive bit of this presentation, I have to say, was the oil platform-esque looking settlement. I'm hmm. very much looking forward to seeing this in person. It was a much more atmospheric look than I was expecting from the new kit that they've put together. They then shifted to discussing the stations of Pyro, which have a completely different style than what we're used to. They currently have six planets and 26 stations in Pyro, and that's a lot of landing locations cool. in space. Most of these stations, though, are run down in a really bad state based on the lore of Pyro. They talked about how the stations now have a great deal more internal space to explore, including maintenance areas and higher tiers unlocked through the said reputation system of the ruling factions. Interiors are also designed to allow players to circumvent low rep gates by sneaking past. This part was really informative for how actions will have consequences even in a lawless system like Pyro, repeatedly killing the wrong faction for example, or just generally being a bad dude, will restrict access to some locations, making them hostile to you on site. This then closed out the panel, leading to the last official one of the day. The Destination Adventure panel centered around their ongoing work with underground facilities, initially shown off at last year's virtual sitcom. 
Cianji reiterated that these are the largest locations in Star Citizen aside from the landing zones that we currently have so and cool. will have a great deal of gameplay. They explain that they will be owned by various scales of faction from companies like Grey Cat, which are on the smaller end, all the way up to the UEE. The owning faction will then determine what the UGF features from level of security or, or what types of items can be found there. For hostile gameplay, the first iteration will have hacking, stealing, search and destroy, VIP, and eliminate missions. On the friendly side though, they'll also offer cargo hauling, resource gathering, mining, and maintenance missions. The location they described in the presentation was a distribution center, which features pads, roads, and loading docks on the periphery, centered by an admin tower which sits atop a large internal storage space and eventually an elevator that will bring you down to the underground part of the facility. That space though is not yet in development, so what they focused on were the other spaces I just mentioned. The admin section will be where players will visit to start down the reputation path for the given faction. Higher rep will unlock the missions there. The tower will also feature VIP suites, mission givers, box deliveries, and other future planned areas. They then discuss the lower part of the facility, and this is where the new hostile mission type raids will occur. In a mock-up, they Ooh. showed how players would attack with a small group of four, fighting off security to reach valuable cargo. There, they would need to secure the cargo on a grav cart and bring it back to the ship to escape, leading to a lot more interesting combat and gameplay. That's awesome. They would then need to load all of that cargo onto a grav cart and bring it back out to the ship to escape. The whole sequence looked really exciting and I can't wait to see this in game for myself. This led them to then discussing the concept for how existing systems could also be used to create puzzles within these locations, which Interesting. looked really great with them stacking boxes on these sort of wall mounted systems. Following the exciting presentation on UGFs, Nick Etheridge, Assistant Environment Art Director, took the stage to give a presentation on hauling cargo and the elusive is a assistant hollow. hangers feature. He began with an explanation for how hauling missions will work, involving reputation with different hauling companies that will allow you to unlock more lucrative contracts. And it looks like what you can haul will also be getting an expansion from hazardous cargo, perishable cargo, mm. fragile cargo, priority cargo, and high risk routes. If you recall, these were featured in a Xeno threat event, so it's great to see them finally expanding it out to the wider universe's economy. But then came a really big one, the cargo lift feature for hangars, which was originally supposed to be part of the cargo refactor way back earlier this year. This is part of the new persistent hangar stuff that CIG have been working on for some time. This is where players will do physical loading of cargo from an inventory onto their ship, so we won't have this automatically done any longer. Okay. They also showed off how a new hover cart that we saw earlier in the raid can be used to assist in loading much more quickly. Oh, nice. This will also, though, enable players to store items physically in their hangar. And then they showed off a huge a quality of life addition to this feature, which will allow us to not just take out cargo, but also to withdraw components as well as vehicles, making it easier to maintain our ships and to load vehicles onto them without spending a whole 20 or 30 minutes prepping just to take a vehicle somewhere as what we have right now. <laughs> Sadly though, there was no discussion of when we can expect to see this feature, only that it's gonna happen sometime Still in the next incredible, months. Man. But then Todd Pappy took the stage for a surprise cap off to the day where he announced Ooh, their concept work for base building. Outposts will have multiple functions such as selling items, extracting resources, crafting, or will serve as a home for you and your org. Building bases will require blueprints though, obtained through the reputation system via rewards and rare shopkeepers. Construction will also require a variety of resources from raw to complex types from around the system. Building of those bases will still be performed by specialized ships. They somewhat revealed a few concepts for small and medium bases, also letting us know that the galaxy will be responsible for large bases, while the capital ship Pioneer Base Builder will be able to do all of it. The locations for bases will also fall into three main categories, high, low, and no security. In high hmm. security, building will require a land claim which must be purchased. There was no mention of whether or not <laughs> oh. we're going to purchase this on the website again, but I think we can safely assume that they're going to monetize this in some way. This will offer... Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if they 
don't monetize that. But I, I have to learn more about the funding model for this game. It's just holy freaking crap, man. That's that's impressive. That's really freaking freaking cool. For the benefit of full protection and basically base invulnerability. And they Ooh, did use that yeah. word, invulnerability, which yeah. is a bit surprising. <laughs> but this will come at the cost of high taxes and fees, high cost of maintenance, and mm -hmm. a much lower financial return than the other two options. You got to pay for that cheddar, man. Like, it's like... You look at, um, <laughs> I, I probably should do a better job promoting it, but I got a couple of shows actually for my comedy uh, coming up in uh, Fort Worth, December 2nd, the 23rd. And uh, one of the things like that's really nice about downtown Fort Worth is you got free parking, but you also have like all this extra security that they ha have for the, like the Sundance Square. And that in and of itself makes it like, it's, it's, it's a tax on everybody, but it ends up making it so that there's that. So having higher taxes and things like that there i think that's a fair trade-off i've often advocated for that especially within uh you know these these systems of like okay we'll just have a tax and then have benefits that turn on and off based off of that it doesn't necessarily mean it's a real world tax it could be using in-game currency uh that then drives that demand again for in-game currency so um that's that's one of the things that i i i tend to to appreciate especially about sandboxes is that the value of like currency has uh, an actual value, the, even the longer you play, as opposed to, uh, you know, where it's just like you get to a point where you're like, yep, money, I don't have anything I need to purchase. There's nothing that I need to do. Uh, but and, and then that ends up leading into frustration from longtime players. It's like, well, what, what could I be doing here? I, I have done everything and there's nothing left to chase. But having that constant uh, demand, the downside of that tends to be that you'll end up seeing uh, people selling real world money uh, in game uh, as as a service, you know, and this could be done through uh, the publisher, but it's also uh, like in the case of like WoW's token, uh, you this also ends up being done like on third party sites. I humans will human, right? Like one of the things that I feel like to people who are like, oh, I don't want that. The cost ends up being that the game in the long run suffers because you as a player can't, you know, like have any kind of thing to chase after a long period of time. And it sucks also sometimes uh, for new players because, you know, it's you're like, hey, I, I, what should I be doing? Anyway, we're, we're almost done. <laughs> this has been insane. I love this thing so much. Losec, on the other hand, will require a land claim, but will only enjoy partial NPC protection and lower taxes in exchange for a higher financial return. Finally, there's going to be no security. This is going to be more like Null Second EVE Online, where mm. you don't need a land claim or to pay taxes, but you're going to have to protect anything you build there, with the benefit obviously being the highest level of profitability. Todd then revealed that they're also exploring what can be done in space, suggesting that space stations are back on the menu, boys. Space stations are back on the on menu. crafting and fabrication mechanics. This will be necessary to populate your base with furniture and specialized modules, which in turn will be able to produce anything from a ship component all the way up to a ship itself. This marks then the first time we've ever really officially heard about players being able to build their own ships. The quality of what you craft and fabricate though will depend on the quality of the resources that you harvest to make them, suggesting oh, that players will also be encouraged to find the best formulas to make a more lucrative crafting economy. In other words, there are going to be people who have better ships than others from being able to craft them better, and this will be more of a skill thing, and I'm excited to see how this affects the game. Dude, this is going to be, like, when you talk about playing in these virtual worlds the way that you want, uh, that's why I like the sandbox approach. And while I think that... In the long run for MMOs, the sand park where you have the sandbox as an MMO, but you also bring in that theme park element to help make uh, it easy. I think in a way, Squadron 42 is in a, is acting as kind of that ease into the universe. Like, hey, we're going to have a narrative story. You can play this. Uh, and then if you want to continue, check out this. <laughs> we also have this universe that you can go uh, experience as well. But to be able to like say, you know what, what do I want to do? Like, it's like, I just want to be somebody who is a smuggler or somebody who just runs materials or somebody who's just like, you know what, I've, I've set up this base and I'm, I'm farming the, the highest materials and you end up creating deals. It ends up creating the opportunity for lots of drama and economy within the game itself and telling like real stories about real people and organizations that we've seen 
hit like the homepage of, you know, <laughs> of news sites, like when in EVE Online, you would see these big battles that end up taking place because people are fighting over resources because there's a demand for that. And people try to lock those things down. And it's just, I think in and of itself, like this just adds into that, 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 that believability about the world, as opposed to something that's just like, yeah, you can play. And then, you know, come, you know, we're going to sell you an expansion every year or two just to keep, you know, keep you checking in with that credit card. But this in and of itself is like, <laughs> it's, un it, it makes the, the, the potential for what this game does differently, uh, stand out dramatically on its own. And that's something I've, like I feel you feel it right away. Like this in and of itself is like yet the heart just keeps saying, "We've been saying this the whole time." But uh, I hope that you know more people are willing to check it out. I think uh, we've seen a lot of like in, in mass the volume of gamers out there tend to prefer the theme park uh, style, and I think Sandbox answers their complaints as longtime players. Like if you look at somebody who complains about. WoW or Final Fantasy 14, like the issues that they bring up, you, you're like, oh, Sandbox has kind of solved that problem. And it's not that Sandbox is perfect. I'm not making that that argument. I just end up preferring it way over the theme park. Other base modules will include refineries, hydroponics, pharmaceutical labs, power Ooh. plants, and more. For the defense of bases, you'll require a shield generator as well as anti-personnel and anti-air turrets to be placed around the structure to protect it from the baddies. That's cool. However, like was said at the beginning of this presentation, this is only in concepting and full production will only begin next year, quarter mm. one. Personally, I think this is going to be huge for the long-term playability of Star Citizen, giving players and organizations something to strive for and to sink their resources into. But let's get to the grand finale of Citizen Con. Chris then took center stage for the big reveal Squadron 42. about Squadron 42, where he announced that the game is feature complete. I have a more detailed video about this and server meshing if you're interested, but to summarize it quickly, they played a 26 minute pre-recorded demo that showed off all of the things they had done throughout the day combined into one <laughs> playthrough. This was a bit of a vindication for CIG's efforts into seemingly unimportant tech as when everything was put together, it really made a lot of sense to create a more visually impressive game than I've maybe ever seen outside of pre-rendered cutscenes. It's worth a watch on its own if you're interested, but if you want a more dedicated summary again, I'll offer links to both my video <laughs> as well as the official one in the that description so cool. below. And that concluded Star Citizen's two-day CitizenCon event, which in my view was the very best that they've ever thrown. The important thing is that they address two major concerns, where Squadron and what's going on with server meshing, and they did it in the best possible way. But I think its success is also owed to the fact that they spent time demonstrating the work instead of just showing us concepts, yeah. which when coupled with the estimate of giving it to us within the next 12 months, made it much more reassuring that they're making real progress. I'm not sure though if that 12 months included Squadron 42, but I think that that's probably their internal Man, goal. that's insane. I imagine this will have given a huge boost to Star Citizen's funding and interest in the community, who have up until this point been pretty apathetic this year, given the lack of content that we've experienced in 2023. Success, though, isn't going to be an absolute certainty, though, because they do need to start delivering. Trust is no longer a given thing, and to some extent, it needs to be re-earned through every patch they release, leading up to Citizen Con next Agreed. year. Agreed, yeah. That said, though, for this backer, I haven't felt this positive about Star Citizen since I backed in 2016. But what about you? How do you feel about this Citizen Con? What was your favorite panel, and what stuck out to you the most? Are you reinvigorated and excited about Star Citizen again, or did they miss the mark in some way for you? Let me know down below, and I hope to see you guys in the next one. All right. Oh, got another video. Sweet. Now, we're not going to dive into that video because this video has been concluded. Thank you to Morph. I'll include a link to the video in the description. Be sure to check it out if you haven't already. Uh, give them some love, especially when it comes to reaction content. I did try to reach out over on uh, Twitter. I haven't heard back yet, but I did talk to Space Tomato, and he did confirm that uh, he did confirm that it's perfectly fine to, to react to, to Morph's content. So I always try to seek out permission uh, in this regards as just kind of like people will say you don't need it, but it's like, I think it just means a lot more, at least to be like, hey, can I check out this video I was asked to? Uh, I don't want to, you know, because 
I think there's this other like set of pressure that people are like, oh, you know, anyway, it's a, it's reaction content. If you guys have never seen, <laughs> you can always follow me on X. I'm complaining about that usually from time to time. Uh, or, you know, I've, I've done videos here on the channel and so much more. It's it's an it's an interesting conundrum and a problem that has a high amount of demand, clearly, because you guys are asking me to react to this content. And I think essentially it's a YouTube problem to fix and they've solved it for the big corporations. They've solved it for shorts. They just haven't solved it for videos like this, where it would be really cool if I could link this video to Morph's video and he could either get a share of the revenue from this video or at least if nothing else, get a share of the any likes and any watch time. So it would help boost up his video in the algorithm as opposed to a, a reaction, which ends up having a longer length. And especially in my case where we discuss a lot of this, and, you know, I don't want to uh, impact his video. So I think the ways I go about it is I tend to wait a little bit, giving videos plenty of time out in the algorithm uh, as opposed to getting because I haven't been reacted to by several big uh, content creators. Uh, it kills my videos like after, you know, especially after multiple reactions. Typically, individ uh, an individual reaction can have a benefit, but over the period of time, it actually has a detrimental effect uh, to the content uh, creator. Uh, in this case, but that is the the, the balance and the journey that we live in uh, today. Now, all that being said, thank you guys so much for joining me for this video. I really hope that you uh, enjoyed it. I really enjoyed watching this. I'm gonna have to check out more of Morph's content. The, the number of, of content creators you've given me has been great, and I'm going to be doing a collab uh, with Space Tomato coming up, which is really exciting. I can't wait to talk to him and get his his thoughts and hear his questions and uh and more and so then what hopefully will that will kind of dovetail into is uh some more like podcast opportunities with some of the different uh, star citizen creators uh as i continue to dive in and learn uh the world and the lore and so special thank you again to everybody who's jumped into the discord has been chatting it up with me uh i really enjoy that especially like this in and of itself is like uh this is my going to the bar time i don't go i don't drink uh right now and uh, I don't go to the bars because generally speaking, uh, you know, I'm, I'm at home with uh, the family and the kids. So being able to, uh, you know, hang out with a bunch of guys, talk video games is a real treat to me. So you guys continue to bless me in that way. But anyway, I'm going to wrap it up, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. Hopefully I'll see you in the next one. And uh, until then, <laughs> take care.